Okay, well, thank you very much for attending in person and for all those people online as well. Thank you for joining us. Um, so this is probably one of the first presentations of this uh, standard because it's yet to be released. So I just want to point out that a lot of the things I'm going to talk about are tentative until the final publication of the standard in the spring of this year. Um, but our, the technical committee, which I was part of, has already done all of their work. And so it's under internal auditing and review of, of the vocabulary and format and things like that by the CSA itself. So it should be released, I think, in April of this year. Um, it's a group effort. Um, the key organizations involved in this initiative were CRWTP, the Center for Research on Work Disability Policy, which is a center that, that I um, co-direct. The CSA group itself obviously is a key player who put the center together and managed the process. And then Conestoga College, um, another key organization that was involved in particular, um, Amin Yazdani, who is, who is a professor at Conestoga College and one of the key people who started up this initiative at the front end about five years ago. So just again, repeating some of those, those key players. Um, the technical committee core members were myself, I chaired this committee, and then two vice chairs, Aminia Stanley from Conestoga College, and, and David Brown, from he's the medical director at CIBC. And then there we had two project managers over the course of developing the, the standard. And here's Amin right here, <laughs> joining us. Glad to have your support. <laughs> um, so, um, and Lin, Nina Lopez and, and David Shanahan, who are both working at the CSA. Oh, okay, sorry, I'm not picking up. Okay, and if I'm not loud enough, just shout out and I'll try to speak up. Okay, so the project started quite a while ago, back in 2014. Um, I won't go through all of the kinds of events and, and, and forums we talked about this initiative, but, but the process took a while because we were seeking funding to get the initiative underway. And the CSA is a cost recovery organization, not for profit, but they need funds to help support development of these standards. Um, so the call for the technical committee that um, developed the standard happened in late fall 2018, and over the course of 2019, we met quite a number of times to draft the standard. And then it went out for public review um, in the late fall of this past year. Um, and then we got that feedback in December and the technical committee just went through the, the feedback one last time to in, integrate any kind of recommendations that came from that review. And then now, as I mentioned, it's currently um, undergoing a technical review within the CSA itself before it, it gets released um, uh, as a standard in the spring of this year. Um, so, um, um, the, so the materials, as I mentioned, are presenting today are really preliminary because it's not yet published. Um, we're planning to continue our activities in this forum in terms of developing some guidance for this standard. Currently, the standard um, is, is a generic um, standard, and I'll get a bit, give a bit more details um, about it as we go through this presentation. But it's really about the the what you know the the, the criterion that an organization needs to fulfill in order to be um, you know, uh, proactive in its work disability management practices. The, the, the how, the guidance is something that we would like to develop you know, subsequently in the years going forward. Um, we do give a bit of tips in terms of implementation um, guidance in, in one of the annexes, but it, it's just a page of, of tips. It's not really enough to really support different contexts and organizations of different sizes and different sectors to really implement the standard. Particularly, we're concerned about small organizations um, struggling with how best to implement the standard. Um, we're developing a paramedics management system standard currently. Um, that is a deep dive into using the foundations of this standard with a focus on post-traumatic stress and mental health. And, and that's been funded by the, the Federal um, Defense Agency, and we are currently completing some background research for a scoping mm -hmm. review, a great literature review, and an environmental scan of needs and, uh, of the paramedics community itself. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I'll do it. I'll try to do that. Okay, so um, I'm wondering how many of you actually went through the public review process in the fall? Did anybody get a chance to actually go on? You did. Just, just one person? That's it? Oh, you did as well? Okay, great. Well, at least a couple of people and probably several people online too. So you're, some of you are familiar with the standard from the public review, at least two of you that are here. And others, um, I mean, obviously was part of the technical committee. So this is um, a 
just a following the generic process by which standards are developed. It's a lengthy process, and I've just highlighted some of the key dates of our CSA Z1011 standard. Um, at the front end, there's a request and evaluation and authorization of whether or not we're going to proceed with a, with a standard. If it does get the authorization to go forward, it's assigned to a particular committee, and this one was assigned to the Occupational Health and Safety Group. I'm not sure the exact formal name of it, um, but it's really in, in the battery of, of standards around occupational health and safety best practices. Then there's a notice of intent that comes out to, to um, um, identify to the public that they're going forward with this standard and a call for, for, for people who are interested in participating in the technical committee. Once that committee is formed, they meet regularly to draft the standard, and then it goes out for public review. And as I mentioned, public review of this standard was out in the fall of 2019. Once the technical committee reaches consensus on, on both, obviously, the details of the standard that were developed before the public review, but also on the pub for public review feedback, um, it goes for pre-approval, and then where it currently is at is technical content approval, procedural approval, and then final edit and publication that happens this spring of 2020. And then there'll be a whole battery of dissemination activities. And, and down the road, on a periodic basis, I think it's about a five-year period, there's a, a review of the standard and maintenance of it to see if there's any updates needed. So this, this process for developing the standard is meant to be open and inclusive. So members of the technical committee are, um, de that develop the standard are, are selected to represent the various stakeholders of interest in the particular area that the standard is being developed. All of the decisions are, are, are reached by consensus, so the group has to agree to move forward on a particular item and present it, the, the details of the standard in that area. Um, that that they feel are they're all comfortable with. So there was a long process of kind of reaching consensus on various components of the standard that we put together. The CSA group also uh, participates in other ways beyond just developing their own standards. They also participate in ISO standards. And there is a bit of talk maybe of taking this standard to the ISO level, particularly because there is no other standard of this sort anywhere in the world. So this is the first of its kind. Um, the, the preference is to adopt international standards wherever feasible, but obviously in this case there wasn't an international standard on, on in this area. Um, these standards are voluntary. It's really important to remember that these are voluntary. They might sometimes be referenced in legislation, but in general they're voluntary, so the legislative requirements of organizations are assumed to be a baseline, and the standards go over and above the requirements of the law. So the technical committee for, for this particular standard, Z1011, had, had uh, uh, over 25 people involved. And there were some individuals who, who joined and left afterwards, others were replaced. And so I think it was 25 to 27 members and several non-vote voting members as well. Extensive efforts were made really by the CSA and myself and the minute we were helping them select the technical committee to be sure we're representing diverse stakeholder groups. There's quite a number of stakeholder interests in this policy arena. Um, and I've listed a number of them that were represented in this technical committee. So we had obviously employer representatives and labor union, injured workers, disabled workers were all key stakeholders, but there's also all the service mm -hmm. providers, health and safety professionals, return to work specialists, experts in disability mm -hmm. prevention, legal counsel, the insurers, workers' compensation, and the private insurers as well were represented, um, as well as myself and, and a few other academics who represented sort of the evidence base and knowledge that, that underpin um, best practice guidance from, from the, the peer review literature in particular. So just framing the problem and why we thought it was important to address this area with this standard, um, well, um, many of you have probably seen in, in the media and in the various studies that have shown how costly work disability is, and both in Canada and internationally. Um, I'm not sure what your, these estimates are, but it's been estimated to be between one and two trillion dollars worldwide. And some recent work done in Canada identified the cost of exclusion because people have disabilities and are not be able to participate actively in the labor market and other social roles. It's been identified as being about 17.6% of GDP. Across, this is across all social domains, but the productivity and output component alone is $62.2 billion, or 3.2% of GDP. So quite a large loss 
to, to, to individuals and to society in terms of, of not being able to fully participate in the labor market. Um, the prevalence of, of chronic and episodic disability is increasing as the age, labor force ages. Um, you know, disability associated with poor mental health is also on the rise. That's a really pressing issue in a lot of developed countries. High levels of unemployment among people with disabilities and, and current practices for work disability management really don't address the needs. They're very, very piecemeal. They're often based on, um, you know, on not based on an organizational approach, a systematic, proactive approach, but are more reactive in nature. So, really, a pressing need to address this. Um, the policy and standards gap, and in fact, I was surprised to hear when Amina and I first started talking about this that this area had not been touched on in the standards world up until this point in time. And we went forward with spearheading this initiative in 2014. So, a really obvious gap that needs to be filled in the standards world. So, the the purpose of the standard then is um, um, uh, providing organizations with a way to incorporate best practices in work disability management into their management systems and day-to-day -day operations. Um, it's, it's a developed, it's where we would set up to develop a consensus-based framework for the management of work disability at the organizational level to address both physical and mental health needs of workers. So it's really covering both physical and mental health needs. Um, it includes consensus-based guidance for recruitment, hiring, and onboarding of workers with disabilities as well. So this is another layer of it. We weren't focusing just on the employer's uh, obligation to its existing workforce, but also in the recruitment, um, hiring, and onboarding process as well. And then we were providing some, some support mm -hmm. for implementation mm -hmm. tips through, some, through one of the annexes. So um, I'm wondering how many of you are familiar with standards in general and how to help implement standards in, in a particular organization? I know maybe you've had quite a bit of background. Have other people? So you have a little bit? Okay. So some of my colleagues here, yeah, and you have as well? Okay, so a few people. So I'm, it's interesting to hear that not many people have had experience with standards. So I'm, I'm actually in my presentation going to start off with some fundamentals around what we mean by management systems and how these systems can be standardized through these best practice guidance tools. So the systems approach, um, um, traditionally um, work disability um, within an organization is assigned to a particular person. They call it disability manager. Um, maybe possibly that person sits within human resources or, or within an occupational health and safety department. So oftentimes when we were talking about this standard to people, when we were first kind of shop it around as an idea to move forward on, people thought we were talking about the function of a particular person's responsibility within the organization, an HR person, a disability manager. And they really didn't understand what we meant by the word um, um, disability management system. So I'll look, there was a lot of education required just to get people up to speed on the vocabulary of management systems and a systems approach to work disability management. Uh, so some organizations actually farm it out. You know, in fact, some large organizations we spoke to farm a lot, out a large part of their disability management needs. Um, and most of them, we found, just take a reactive approach. You know, even when they're evaluating their performance, they're using um, in indicators such as absence days. And some people actually call it absence management. And we were, had long discussions with some of the stakeholders about the difference between disability management and absence management. And I'll get in a little bit into that shortly. So the systems approach is meant to be proactive. Right? Consider there's a roles and responsibilities across the organization. So it's not just about one person's role, but everybody's role in, in this management system and between the management of work disability. It considers inputs, you know, process outputs, and feedback. And evaluation improvement is on a continual basis. So it's not a, um, a role that's assigned to somebody and it's predefined how they practice their role. It's a continuous improvement process. So a management system then is a framework, a formalized framework of policies, processes, and procedures used by an organization to meet its, its objectives. You, it has to be documented and tested. It's step-by-step -step methods aimed at smooth functioning of the organization across its various activities. And audits are really vital part of that management system approach because um, continual improvement is really critical. So measurement, evaluation, through auditing processes are really important to understand where there are still gaps and needs to be met. Ideally, um, the, the organization has this kind of framework in place to address all of its core aspects um, 
and activities, including work disability management. So work disability management is just one piece of the management um, systems um, you know, framework. Um, so, so the systems approach work dis disability management ensures that there's clarity, consistency, because it's documented and tested. Um, and it's integrated into the other organizational activities. It really needs to dovetail with the other activities within the organization. It's proactive, as I mentioned. It really addresses health needs of the worker before they, they become disabled, and before there's an absence, hopefully, you can address their health needs so that there doesn't necessarily have to be an absence. So that's how it's really different from, from absence management. Um, and we sometimes use the word work disability prevention to, to describe that notion of dealing with people's health needs before they're disabling. In fact, we wanted to originally have the word disability prevention in the terminology of the naming of the standard and throughout the body of the standard, but a lot of people are not familiar with that terminology. So we decided to work with the terminology of disability management well, rather than disability management prevention. Okay, so, um, so um, this is, puzzle actually does a good job of describing how it has to fit together with the existing management system. The health and safety standard Z1000 is already in place and there's an ISO equivalent of it and we're bringing in the work disability management system standard to that management systems framework. So here's um, sort of a, a, a visual of management systems modeling um, from the health and safety executive. Um, at the top, we see there's policies that, that identify how the organization is developed and operates. There's a planning process and implementing of new policies and practices and programs, measurement and performance uh, evaluation through audits and reviews that take you back up to reassessing you know, what are the next cycle of, 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 of targets that you want to achieve. And as you can see through this kind of roundabout way through the audit, there, there's a notion of that continual improvement going on there. So policies are, are, are need to be set through with clear directions for the organization to follow these policies. Um, management structures are in place to deliver those policies. Um, there's a planned um, systematic approach to implementing new policies. Um, performance is measured against some standards or, or, or um, benchmarks to ensure that they're re reaching the targets and, and identifying areas that need improvement. And then they learn from the experience and apply um, lessons to it and go through the cycle on a periodic basis. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of mm -hmm. the continual improvement process. And that fits in very well with the, the framing of this standard and many of the management system standards that the CSA has developed. It's on a plan, do, check, act kind of process. Um, PDCA is the acronym used for that, and some of you may have heard that. So that's that continual improvement process where at the front end, you're planning, you're establishing some objectives of what you want to do in this cycle. Um, then you implement that plan, you check through monitoring and evaluation of progress, have you reached those targets, and then you review and take action to improve if it needs to, to, to be adjusted. And once you reach your target, you go back and you go through the process again on a periodic basis. And there's always room for improvement. That's why that notion of continual improvement is you know, you might start off really with fundamentals if you're new to the, the area of work disability management, some basic um, programs, policies, and practices need to be put into place. Other organizations might be very far ahead in this cycle and have a, quite a well-established um, work disability management system, but look to see if there's incremental stuff they can work on to the better meet the needs of their workforce. Sure, okay. Okay, so, the framework, oh, what happened there? You can keep, okay. sorry, you have oh, to keep okay, sorry, there it is. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, so a, the framework for this standard is meant to be really broadly applicable to, to facilitate in integration with other organizational activities, as I mentioned. So there are other standards that are relevant to this area, but, you know, related to the occupational health and safety field, the CSA Z1000, the 1003, which is the mental health one. There's a quality management, there's a ergonomics one as well. So there's quite a number of other standards that need to fit into this, this standard. So we made sure that it was sympathetic and dovetails well with existing standards. Oops. Sorry. Sorry.
Yeah, not. the other aspect of it too is it's really a, a, like I use the terminology joint management, where where operations and other activities in the organization are also responsible for addressing the needs of their workforce in the area of, of their health needs and work disability management. It's not a person's role; it's a joint role across all all supervisors, managers, and, and workers within the organization. So it really needs to be integrated with all those other activities and responsibilities. We've tried to use a common language and terminology. I'll come up, come forward with some of the vocabulary that we're using on key terms um, to give you a sense of the, the kind of philosophical underpinnings uh, of the um, the standard. Um, the vocabulary we use predominantly comes from other uh, standards that are already out there. We try to be consistent with existing standards. So that's here's the framework and some principles. Um, so. These are high-level kind of principles by which um, the standard is, is framed. So a well-functioning system is meant to be worker-centered, and, and that's a, some terminology that we also define in the standard. It takes a case-by-case -case contextualized biopsychosocial approach and focuses on maintaining worker um, engagement. So I've highlighted some of the key words, really worker-centered, it has to be contextualized, you know, accommodating the workers' specific needs rather than a generic approach. The biopsychosocial approach, I have a slide down the road that I'll talk a little bit more about this framing of, of health as a biopsychosocial notions of health. It's important to to avoid viewing disability exclusively through a health lens, you know, the context makes a difference, so accommodations um, are really critical to think about how you meet a worker's health needs, not just through healthcare services, but appropriate accommodations in the workplace. Um, the work disability management process considers the worker's role within the organization, so when you're accommodating the worker, you have to take into the consideration their actual role, rather than thinking about as a first cut to assign them to a completely different task and see if you can accommodate accommodate them in their existing roles. Um, they're, they're, you have to think about their essential duties and also the physical and psychological demands of their job when you take into consideration how best to accommodate them. Organizations and workers take a joint responsibility, so it's not just a person like the supervisor or manager that takes responsibility for it, but they jointly work with the worker and other people in the organization who can help make the accommodations work for the worker. And, and I just note that we're using the term worker rather than employee, and that's a, a key thing I, I want to emphasize, and I have a bit of a definition here. Um, a worker is a person who could be employed by the organization or under the day-to-day -day, um, control of the organization. It could be a paid or unpaid role. It includes workers, supervisors, managers, leaders, contractors, service providers, volunteers, students, and other stakeholders actively engaged um, in the activities for the benefit of the organization. So a broad definition of worker. And remember, this is a voluntary standard, so we go above minimum requirements of the law. So most people might think of a worker just being the employee, but there are other people who might be on the work site who, who have health needs that need to be accommodated as well. And ideally, the organization would want to address their health needs as well, even if they're not directly engaged in a labor contract under which they would be considered an employee. And often, um, employers will, will have staffing that come from camping agencies for short-term demands of labor needs and things like that. They wouldn't be considered a worker, but they might have health needs that need accommodation. Um, I, I mentioned that the health needs of workers need to be addressed proactively before the onset of, of work disability. So proactive prevention versus reactive intervention really ensures that there's minimal disruption in the worker's engagement and, and their work productivity, you know, in the workplace relationship as well, in the worker's personal life. So if you can accommodate them early, they're le less likely to take an absence, there's less likely to be productivity and bottlenecks uh, occurring in the organization, and they'll help in maintain that engagement. The longer a person's off work, the harder it is to get them back to work. So if you can accommodate them before an absence is necessary, that's the ideal situation, to, to, to the best way to act on that kind of situation, and that kind of need. Um, work disability um, management may include accommodating the work in order to prevent unnecessary absences, but if there is an absence, really focus on early and safe return to work when the absence does occur. So, and, as I mentioned, prevention uh, efforts are best framed as a um, continuum 
Um, really thinking about from primary prevention where you reduce exposures to secondary prevention when, when a health need arises or tertiary prevention when they're actually off work and need some kind of health care. We think of that as a continuum. There's not a, a distinct, you know, categorical um, distinction between primary and secondary. You know, where, wherever there's a health need that's arising, you address that need as soon as you can. Um, so um, I've given some definitions here for primary, secondary, and tertiary for people who aren't familiar with, with that vocabulary. Um, so even though our standard is really focused on a health needs when they arise, and there's a, we want to make sure it, it's a continuum from the Z1000, which is, addresses primary prevention and reducing exposures that cause adverse health conditions in the workplace. So really, you have to think of that as being kind of really dovetailed together so that there's not a break between primary and secondary prevention. We also frame um, the continuum in terms of managing a worker's health needs over the time within the organization. So you think about their career within a, within the organization over their life course in the labor market. So you want to think about the onboarding recruitment um, at the front end when they're first hired. You know their 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 life within the organization as they go through different roles and maybe possibly moving up within the organization. And then later on in their lives, they may exit for either another job, another organization, or into retirement. And so we think about that continuum as well and their health needs as they change over that. That, that life course within the labor market with, with your organization. I have actually a diagram of, of that's from the introduction to the standard where we kind of frame that life course perspective. Here are some other guiding principles that underpin the standard. It has to be an evidence-informed, data-driven approach that's strategic in nature to ensure sound policies and, and processes. It has to focus on inclusion and accessibility to promote engagement and belonging. You know, taking a worker-centered approach, as I mentioned, supportive approach that's contextualized and case by case, promoting um, early accommodation before there's an absence. Um, you know, and that considers the essential duties of the worker's role within the organization. <coughs> Joint responsibility between the organization's management. The workforce, you know, the worker representatives, where they're applicable, labor or union representation. Legal compliance obviously is a baseline critical part of, of being compliant with jurisdictional specific requirements. And as I mentioned, this is voluntary standards, so it really meant, is meant to go over and above the requirements of the law. So here's um, from the World Health Organization framework the, the notion of a biopsychosocial approach to health where a health condition or, 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 or an impairment of body function or structure deficit may result in some kind of activity limitations or participation restrictions, but not necessarily. A critical are the contextual factors, the environment and the person's characteristics, and the context can be appropriately ad adapted to meet their health needs in most cases so that even if you may have a health condition or an impairment, it doesn't necessarily have to be disabled. So this is the life course perspective. I don't think you can probably read all of the details, but this is our framing of thinking about a worker's health needs over their life course, so on, on recruitment and hiring, on the onboarding, during the continuity advancement within the organization, and then employment exit as, as well, thinking about how you meet their health needs as they transition to whatever they're going to, another organization or to, reti to retirement. And so um, we've tried to make this standard generalizable, as all standards are at the CSA, um, for specific contexts of an organization um, that's applicable to different sizes in private or public sector, for profit, not for profit, or operating in any jurisdiction within Canada. So it, by its nature, then, it's going to be very high level um, and, and, and require um, a lot more details for implementation. That's where we really feel there's going to be need for implementation guides, particularly for certain small organizations and organizations who are new to the world of standards and new to the world of disability management. Um, so it's based on the idea that w work disability management is a strategic and dynamic process and it's integrated into the overall business practices. I mentioned it considers both physical and mental health needs. The standards I also mentioned is the what and what you need to do to be compliant with best practices. Implementation is the how, which you will need to develop some guidance down the road. 
Um, there, as I mentioned, there's also some implementation um, tips provided in one of the annexes. So here's um, a high-level view of the content of the standard. Um, you know, there's the background information at the front end and some core um, sections that are really framed around the PDCA kind of continual improvement um, concept. And then a number of annexes that help support some of the deep dives into specifics, including one that's on implementation tips. And here I've just highlighted some of the subsections with, within the, the, the core um, um, sections. You know, the work is building management system and ensuring that there's commitment from the senior levels of the organization and, and, and all the right things are in place to go forward with adopting or advancing your work disability management system. If you're ready to go forward, you go through a planning phase and the details there about how to go through that planning cycle. Implementation <laughs> follows once you uh, uh, assess uh, where, where you want to target first and what targets you want to achieve in this cycle, you implement them, and then there's performance monitoring and evaluation and continual improvement process that takes you through an auditing process, hopefully, that identifies when you've reached your targets and whatever, whatever areas still need to be um, resolved in the next cycle. So for, for the front end, the, the WDM system is a framework that involves the key stakeholders and the senior management are critical, frontline management supervisors as well. Sometimes there's internal subject matter experts that get involved and sometimes there's external experts as well, healthcare professionals, workers and their representatives and the unions or labor representation. The planning cycle then is necessary to review current and inter internal and external practices and resources, identify where there's key gaps, establish the objectives and targets that are appropriate for, for the organization, and develop an action plan on how, how to achieve them through this cycle. Mm -hmm. Then you move on to the implementation with an, an orderly, well thought out plan is essential to this process in order for it to be successful. The organization is going to need to monitor initial rollout to quickly identify any potential problems or gaps. So it's really critical to really be, keep an eye out for any kind of gaps that might arise. And the auditing process will help identify some of those gaps and areas that need improvement. And then lastly, um, the monitoring and evaluation enables the organization to identify whether it's been successful in reaching those tar targets, opportunities to intervene and reduce risk, increase efficiencies, and uh, this will obviously have to be appropriate for the size and, and sector nature of the organization, where it's at, what its work disability management system currently. Um, just some terminology for the many of you don't know the standards world. So um, there's some really fundamental vocabulary that's used a lot in, in standards. Um, the notion of shell is used to express a requirement. So whenever something is we felt was necessary to be compliant with this standard, we use the word shall. It's an obligation of sorts. The term should is expresses recommendations, um, if, you know, strong sentiment that it's important, but it's not absolutely necessary. And then may is another terminology that's used a lot to express um, an optional kind of uh, um, element that's not critical to meeting the criteria of the standard by it, but is um, recommended by us. <coughs> So the expected outcomes then um, from this standard, and we're hoping this, this will improve organizational performance in operations and in human resources. Um, if it's integrated well with the existing management system and other um, standards around the um, occupational health and safety system management. Um, hopefully there'll be shorter sickness absences and reduced turnover and increased productivity. Um, effective management of workers and other stakeholders as well. It'll also advance um, supervisor, manager, and HR skills around performance management and, and addressing worker health needs. Um, increase employer capacity to address their obligations under various legislation, such as human rights and, and disability inclusion legislation, um, at the, both the provincial and federal level. Yeah. It'll also and hopefully enhance their public profile um, when employers adopt this standard. And ultimately, we're looking to see an improvement in productivity at the societal level if, if it's widely adopted across various sectors in both public and private sectors. We had a release, um, a media release um, back last fall just announced that this um, standard was going forward and that it was up for public review. And this is just an excerpt from that media release. I won't get into any details of that, but that, that, that was just announcing that there was a public review was open. 
we're now planning, and I mean, I've just been talking about having a launch of, of the standard in April when it's released, um, possibly having a day-long symposium somewhere um, accessible to, to various stakeholders here in southern Ontario. Um, it'll be hosted by key partners, the CSA group, um, or CRWDP, and Conestoga College. And we'll have presentations from the key stakeholders, you know, um, labor or um, organizations, um, workers' compensation um, representatives and private insurance representatives as well. Hopefully have an opportunity to get some questions and answers in there to help get people up to speed. And for myself and I mean, uh, other academics who are, who are working in this area, we would like to undertake a research program to evaluate uptake, both process evaluation, effectiveness evaluation, and economic evaluation to, to get a good sense of how well it's working in the field. And hopefully some of that may feed into some of the implementation guidance mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, Canada will be the first um, country in the world to have a standard in this area. So we're setting a precedent. There might be some um, um, opportunity to bring it up to the ISO level if, if once we had it out in the field. Um, it's timely, I think, also given some developments at the federal level. Um, I'm not sure if you all know about the Accessible Canada Act, that, but that was made into law back in June of last year. And they've also developed um, a, a standards organization to help implement some of the, the, the needs around the Accessible Canada Act. And employment is one of the priority areas there as well. So, so this really feeds into some of the federal level developments. Um, and there's, as I mentioned, plans to investigate the possibility of bringing it up to the ISO level as well. There's other occupational health and safety uh, system related standards at the CSA, so 175 of them. A number of them um, are, are referenced in legislation, so this really fits in well with, with, with the library of other standards that the CSA has already available to, to various organizations. And that leaves some time for, for discussion, questions. Um, I just want to add, we have people online who will have questions as well. So, Emil, if you have a question from the audience, I am, and I came over here so people online will hear me, um, could you please repeat the question loudly for those okay. who are online? Mm -hmm. okay, we'll and uh, maybe we'll start, Bob, with you, and then if there's not. I really like mm -hmm. the presentation, and the thing that goes through my mind, because I like to do management by slogan, the slogan is you get results from what you inspect, not from what you expect. So. If, if I was running a company like this, I would make sure that I had a good inspection routine mm -hmm. because if I didn't, then I yeah. think more people would get injured. Yeah, I like that expression, inspect rather than expect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? I, I actually have, oh, sorry, go ahead, Linda. Thanks, Emil. Um, how does this compare with NIDMAR standards? Okay, well, NIDMAR does a lot of training around disability management as a, as a role. And, and they certify people as disability managers. Um, and, and a number of people have that, both working within organizations and also working for the service providers, such as workers' compensation boards or private insurers. So that's a really critical um, function that they play. And it really still is important, even within to the context of, of this standard, where there might be some person who has a role in helping with the administrative process of processing claims with the workers' compensation board or with private insurers. But that's not sufficient to have a fully functioning work disability management system. So this takes it much more broadly across the organization. So I think it fits well with what they're doing and adds a new layer to the notion of work disability management. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I forgot you your question. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Is, uh, how do you compare the cost benefit analysis when you are developing these standards? Well, Can we you repeat that? Yes. Please? How do you determine the cost benefit when we're developing this kind of a system? Well, we haven't done a, a, a cost benefit analysis currently in terms of this standard that going forward when it's being implemented in various organizations that is our desire to do that in conjunction with the implementation within different organizations we've had a few organizations organizations come forward asking us to help with implementation um, but there is a literature um, um, our, on cost benefit analysis around different disability management programs and practices that we drew on for some of our evidence base. It's not a large evidence base, but there is some studies that have been done. But going forward, we will need to do um, some cost-benefit analysis, effectiveness evaluation, cost-effectiveness evaluation, 
as organizations implement them and on least this standard. So that'll be important evidence base to, to confirm our, our, our understanding from the existing literature that it's it, the best interest of the organization both financially and in terms of the people orientation to, to develop this kind of a uh, management system around disability management. But that evidence base still needs to be developed as we move forward. And I think we have a comment or two, a question or two mm -hmm. online. Yes. So Sarah? You don't have to repeat it. Okay, good. <laughs> so how, uh, this is from Jeanette Coons. How uh, does the framework address the employer's inability to inquire about a worker's health in order to be proactive, as you have recommended in here, when there's privacy legislation that prevents an employer asking about the worker's health directly? So what would you recommend to fulfill the standard being proactive? Okay, well that's a really good question, and I don't need to repeat it because people heard it from Sarah. Um, so um, there, confidentiality is a big issue, um, you know, obviously, and particularly for mental health conditions where there may be some stigma associated with it. But in general, there's a requirement to, to respect people's privacy that they don't need to reveal what their health condition is, but what their accommodation needs are. So the, the, st the standard does speak to how to manage that aspect and, and, and respect that confidentiality. And there is a, a, an annex that also gives a little bit more background on that. So it is a critical thing and, and a skill set that supervisors and managers need to develop in order to understand how to negotiate the process of respecting people's privacy. It's still addressing their, their needs for accommodation when they arise. I was just going to add that there's a grant here at the Institute that's looking at new tools to help okay. communicate yeah, and you not You might disclose. want to give a little bit more detail about that. <laughs> I, yeah. no, I, I'll, so Monique is helping us. one, particularly okay. for chronic episodic mm -hmm. disabilities, and which includes mental health as well as you know arthritis and other kind of physical kind of conditions as well, that helps um, both supervisors, managers, organizations, and, and workers navigate the disclosure um, issues and processes that, that, that might be, they may be grappling with. And, and that's currently being developed and, and hopefully will be available shortly after our standard is out. <laughs> Good matching of, uh, right. of, of tools and resources for the standard. So well, one, do you have uh, yes, there's yeah. a comment from Jennifer Evans. She just wanted to point out that while the employer does have a duty to inquire probably about accommodations or needs, uh, there's often a lack of trust between the worker and the employer, thereby impacting the employer's ability to effectively accommodate the mm -hmm. worker. So this is where a third party could be helpful in further addressing the worker's situation and identifying effective accommodations. So some organizations would consider hiring a third party to help them implement the standard. Yes, certainly we're not uh, 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 suggesting that uh, organizations on their own doing this, and I really think there some organizations, particularly small ones, will need support on how to implement this. Large organizations, as I said, already some of them do farm out some aspects of their disability management needs, so it's not suggesting that it's all going to be in-house, but certainly there's a skill set that needs to be developed and a management system that needs to be, to be developed within the organization as well. It's not something that you can be passive purchaser of services and not have to think about your workers' health needs. It's really a, a proactive approach is still critical regardless of if you draw on external expertise or, or have a lot of it available in-house. In addition to tools, when she mentioned tools, the rule on tools is if you don't have tools, you don't have carpenters. Mm -hmm. And if you do have tools, you only may have carpenters. So. The focus is you've got to have the right tools. <laughs> good, another good one there. <laughs> have the right tools. <laughs> I think we have another question here. Yes. And, do, and, and then, yeah. I just want to add. Oh, uh, okay. I just want to add something. The standard uh, will be made available in both English and French. Mm -hmm. By July, that's the time that they set for it. We're pushing for it every May. So we we'll hope that we get that before it's time to start. Uh, but it's now set for July. Okay, the French version. And then yeah. the English version. Okay. Yeah. Can you just repeat that for people? Yeah, so, okay, so somebody just mentioned, uh, I mean, actually, who, who is the vice chair of, of the standard committee. Um, we, um, we have the English version coming out in April, but a French version will be available by July. Well, they will be, they will be both available in July in both English and French. Okay. We're pushing for the April May release. Oh, okay, so we're getting both of them will might come out as early as April. Okay, that's okay. Sorry, I got that. Makes sense. So, so ideally, we'll have French and English in April, but at the latest in July. Yes. 
common question in when they're developing it is that series is address. So how do you think do you think this standards align with Copenhagen questionnaire related to the psychosocials? Can you repeat that? Does it does this standard align yeah. with the, the Copenhagen psych- questionnaire? Okay. Oh, the Copenhagen questionnaire on or the psychosocial. Um, we didn't explicitly kind of um, work with that questionnaire to see how well this fits into it, but I mean, I mean, maybe you might yeah, have some so comments about this. So the Copenhagen, they're talking about the top stock. Yeah, top stock. So that is specifically designed for addressing psychosocial hazard in the workplace, and this uh, psychosocial uh, 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 management system is kind of CSS at 2003. They have and uh, should use the on mind at work uh, questionnaire as a reference tool which is developed in DC. In this standard, we are not recommending any of those tools, cops or either God in mind at work. Mm-hmm. We, we talk about the process. Yes. So God in mind and God in mind and cops are they are tools to assess psychosocial health and safety in the workplace. So again, these are yeah. uh, Specifically, the Guardian yeah. Mind Network was the tool for assessment developed for the CSA Z1003. It was developed by DC. But it's referenced within the CSA We haven't referenced either that or, or yeah. the Copenhagen questionnaire. Um, but our, our standard does dovetail with the Z1003, so by, by its nature, it also fits well or the, uh, indirectly to the Guardian Minds questionnaire, I would think. Uh, Ron and then Linda? Um, so, Amelia, you mentioned that the federal government has established um, a body to develop accessibility standards under the federal legislation that will apply to federally regulated employers, including a standard related to employment. And so I'm just curious as to whether there is some sort of liaison going on between the work of the CSA and the work of CASDO to develop an employment uh, standard for accessibility. Okay, that, okay, I'll try to repeat that. Okay, so um, Bron was asking about the, the federal body created that's called CASDO, an Canadian Accessibility Standards Organization, um, and, and how their employment priority area fits with work that the CSA might be doing or other organizations. Well, first of all, I should mention that one of the people who are sitting on the technical committee, Maureen Hahn, is also on the CASDO board, so that link helps kind of dovetail those, those those activities together. Um, the the CSA um, is a, and others are actually responding to a recent call from CASDO for for developing um, standards and other guidance um, in various areas that, that are under the umbrella of CASDO. The priority areas don't include just employment, but that's one of the priority areas. So it's more broadly scoped. There's seven priority areas. Um, so they are reaching out to others to help with that. They are, I'm not sure to what degree they would be developing standards in-house as opposed to working with other organizations such as the CSA to develop standards. Um, I don't think that's all completely clear to the extent of what in, or what will be in-house versus externally um, farmed out, but currently it seems there's a big call for other organizations such as the CSA and researchers and other community groups to, to come forward with proposals to develop guidance. So, and I, I'm assuming that'll be their practice is to reach out to these various communities to, to help with the process rather than doing it in house. So, I think by that, just that their motors operand of uh, going externally for these kinds of things suggests that they'll be well integrated with what's happening in this in this area, more broadly speaking, as opposed to working in silos. Linda, and then Peter. I'm familiar with several of the occupational health and safety management standards, so focused on primary prevention. Uh, and a lot of the elements seem similar to what you presented, not surprisingly. Uh, one that seemed novel to me was the one about improving mm-hmm. culture. Could you tell us a bit about what that element is, is concerned with? Okay, so, so the, the, the question is about um, the element of improving culture and, and, and that being seeming to be something more than what we have seen in other standards that are related to, 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 to this one, such as, I guess, the Z1000. Um, I, I imagine, I'm not sure the details of Z1003, whether this culture is mentioned there, but I'm guessing it fits very well to the notion of people are into culture thinking about, um, you know, mental health needs mm-hmm. of the workforce in terms of primary prevention. Culture um, is really important in this standard because we think about um, being worker-centered, concerned about the workers' um, needs, 
um, and, and, and contextualized and, and, and fitting the specific situation at hand rather than standardized in terms of generic formulas to how to address workers' health needs. Um, and try to maintain their engagement in, in, in the workplace, that they're that it's jointly managed rather than done um, you know, um, top-down kind of thing, so the workers play an active role in, in, in the process of identifying you know, best accommodations to meet their needs and the evaluation of those, those accommodations. So that, that, that all kind of frames it around the notion of having a, a people-oriented culture in order to to, to really frame it around meeting workers' health needs. And over the life course as well, as we pointed out, and on the onboarding as well. So, I think, so we're really thinking about workers in the broader mm -hmm. labor market over their time in the labor market. So, so, so trying to make sure it's not just addressing um, the minimum standards of the law that are just their uh, direct employees. Okay, thank you. Peter. Emil, thank you. Um, I, I enjoyed uh, a clear description of the expected outcomes for organizations. and. Also, your plans to evaluate certain components of the standard, which I assume can be then fed in as part of like continual improvement mm -hmm. of, of what works and doesn't work. Is that funded through the same funding envelope, or is it something you'll be expected to do separately? And if it is separate, why isn't that a standard part of standard development? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, I, to summarize, if I say, he's asking about the research we plan to do going forward and whether it's part of, of the funding of the envelope that we currently have, um, which it's not, and, and why it's not, um, you know, it's a big complex question, um, but I'll try to address you know, our plans just going forward and how we've framed it. Um, at the front end, we were looking to get funding to support both the development of a standard and some implementation guidance. We did get some funding, particularly for the, the paramedic standard, which has allowed us to do some, some um, groundwork in terms of research evidence synthesis um, to feed into um, the, the standard, which is going starting up. And I think in April, we'll have our first technical committee meeting for that standard. So <laughs> Amin and myself and others are doing some evidence synthesis for the peer review and um, um, grade editors and just the needs assessment, particularly focused on post-traumatic stress and mental health for first responders, paramedics specifically. So that if the funding envelope allows for that front end, that's great because the CSA needs to do cost recovery. The tail end of it, you know, once it's implemented and, and evaluating things in the field, is a whole other world, which we will be getting into going forward. It's not part of a funding envelope just because the process, first of all, is, is quite extensive. It took three or four years to develop this standard to get it to where we are at today kind of thing. The other part will probably take three or four years as well, field work, before you can see a full cycle of implementation being, and being um, gone through by an organization to assess you know, the, the outcomes of that first cycle or, or wherever they are at in their continual improvement process. So I just, in practicality, I can't see a, uh, an agency funding you know, 10 years of research around this kind of thing. It just, it, by its nature, like all, a lot of research is done in different stages, compartmentalized. Um, and and our, our task is now to go forward to look for, for funds to help support that, that tail end field work. But so the idea would be that if you do get to do that, so although we want organizations to plan to check it by the way, mm -hmm. you want to just do it by mm -hmm. silos. If you did do that, there would be an opportunity to feed it back into the standard? To, 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 mm -hmm. yeah, there is a, a review process yeah, that so happens every would, five yeah. years, for sure there is. Um, our front end stuff will also be about, I mean not front end, but our, our front end stuff of our work now going forward will be about developing some implementation guidance more broadly, particularly for the, for the paramedic standard. There is funding within that envelope to do that, and hopefully some of that Fundamentals will help us develop more broader guidance, but we'll need some funding to fully flesh that out. And then the implementation evaluation will be a whole separate process. But yes, by that time, it'll be up for a review, five year review. Yeah, so, so it'll be an opportune back. moment to, to kind of think back of how we can fine tune if there is need for it to some of the details of the standard. I mean, you see, to, to speak up. Great point saying the paramedics community, they're very interested in this project. and through conversations with the government agencies on this project, they are very interested in implementation and evaluation. This is a problem that they are struggling with, including PCSI, in one service I have visited, uh, the, uh, about 10% of their, uh, their workforce is on 
and disability because of his design. So it's kind of significant cost issue for them, and they're very interested in implementation. So there is, given our established relationship with them, uh, huge possibilities of being able to do this implementation of that. Yeah. 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 Work to be done. Yeah. And maybe that's, uh, we're, we're running right to the end of our hour. Okay. One, one quick question. You mentioned the public consultation. Yes. Have you heard back? Did you get big uptake? Did people seem enthusiastic? Yeah, we, we, or? The public consultation process ended, closed at December 6, I think it was. And we had a, a couple hundred people feedback, some, some really good suggestions, which we reviewed at, at a two-day meeting in, in mid-December um, and worked through December to integrate into the standard. And, and, and a revised version was submitted to the CSA that's now being technically edited. For, for public, for release to the public in April or maybe as late as July. Yeah. And there will be another opportunity for the technical committee to review when anything is done mm -hmm. prior to publication. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We look forward to the launch of the standard and hearing more about it over time. I really appreciate your sharing this today. Yeah, thank, thank you, Emil. Thank you.